Welcome to the Sand Hills Media Ministry. We hope this production encourages and challenges you to live a more Christ-centered life. Oh man, this is exciting. This is exciting. That intro isn't ever going to get old either. I've heard it twice already. <laughs> I'm waiting for the next one. He's getting me ready. I'm like this down at the bottom. You guys can't really see it, but I'm excited. Um, so, man, I am super excited to be here. If we have never met, my name is Jason. Like Pastor Malcolm said, I'm the campus pastor of our Denny Terrace campus. If you have no clue that we even have a Denny Terrace campus, we have a Denny Terrace campus. It is in Denny Terrace, which is uh, right off of Monticello on the way to um, CIU. There's a little uh, community tucked away in there, um, and so we've acquired that property, and we are now um, starting Denny Terrace, ba- uh, Denny Terrace Baptist. That's what it was called. We're starting Sand Hills Community Church at Denny Terrace, and so I will be leading that charge over there. I'm excited, though, that we get a chance to jump into God's Word together. Um, I didn't have this with me up here for the first service because uh, I forgot, but if you got your handy-dandy notebook, let me see it. Raise it up for us so we could tell Pastor Jeff we were obedient and we went out and, <laughs> and spent our hard-earned money. I got, I got the one, the spiral. I don't know. Does anybody got the spiral back one? Anybody? One in the back? All right. Thought I was the only one. Dang, two. Dang. All right, it was a little more expensive too. Dang. All right, no. So we got that. We are excited to jump into God's word today. We are starting a series in the book of Hebrews. And Pastor Jeff and Dr. Naylor did a fantastic job last week of just giving us a complete overview of the book of Hebrews, which is fantastic. And it's kind of odd to preach through this, um, especially the first chapter given that there's 14 verses, the first three or four verses talk about um, really Christology, like the study of Christ and who he is, and then jumps right into like angels. And the last five, verse five to 14 is basically the writer of Hebrews is telling us how much greater Jesus is than the angels. And so I'm gonna do my best to give you guys what I believe the Lord has given unto me this morning. Um, At the top of your page, if you're taking notes, you can write this as your title. Simply, Jesus is greater. Let me pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you so much for today. Father, I pray that you would use me as you have the prophets of old to speak your word to your people. Father, I pray that you would give me preaching power and permission to speak to your people. Lord, I pray that hearts and minds would be softened to hear you, to not get distracted by anything that's been going on this week or even on the drive over, but for the next few moments, we can fix our eyes on you because when we do that, the cares of life seem to dim and to become less important, if important at all, when we glance at life and gaze at you. Father, I thank you. I love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody that agreed said amen. Amen. All right, so let's jump into the text. Hebrews chapter one. Hebrews chapter one. There's a quote that says, good is the enemy of great. And I've heard someone once say that good enough sucks. It really does, especially if you are capable of much more. Why settle for a piece of the pie when you can have the whole thing? Amen? Amen? <laughs> hey, just a side note. I'm from Cali, right? We don't really do desserts like that. Like, you don't have desserts after most meals in California. You just don't do that. Out here, y'all like, like desserts at every meal. <laughs> at every meal. And we don't do that still because we're from California and we're usually eating Mexican food. And what's a good dessert after that? Tres leches or some churros, but we don't do that. But desserts out here are a real thing. So I thank y'all for that um, because I've really started to like cheesecake. Um, Completely different story, sorry. Um, I've heard it also said that it's a sin to be good when God has called you to be great. 
And what Hebrews does is lays out this really cool, um, lays out this concept that Jesus is better, that he's greater than not only the prophets, but also all of the angels um, that he created. So let's jump into the text. If you're taking notes, your first point is Jesus is greater than the prophets. Starting at verse one and two, it says this, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he spoke, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. Someone say all things. Through whom also he created the world. So in many times and in many ways, it says that God spoke to his people. Um, some of you in the room may say, well, how did that happen? What were some of the ways that he spoke to, to his people? One is in dreams and in visions. You can look in Daniel chapter, um, you can look all through Daniel, but uh, Joel chapter two, um, he spoke in dreams to people who weren't even prophets. He spoke uh, in Genesis chapter 40. He spoke through a musician in 2 Kings, and he spoke by direct audible words to people back in the day. And so I am of the camp that says God can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ever ask or think. I believe that. So if God wanted to speak to me today through a donkey or whatever else you want to call it, or if he wants to speak to me through a burning bush, or if he wants to speak to me through one of you, I would be of the camp that says that is possible because God can do that if he wants to. So let me tell you a story. Back in um, 2018, we were in San Diego, and <clears throat> it was... 2018 in San Diego, I was in a church service or a church auditorium really similar to this, sitting, praying by myself. And there was, I heard a door slam and I don't want to get everybody all like, oh man, this is want signs and wonders and whatever. It's not that. But I serve a God who can speak to me however he chooses to. And if he chooses to speak to you through however he chooses to speak to you, what I can never do and what you can never do is argue with an experience. You can't. If this is how I believe God spoke to me, we'll see. We'll see. If you tell me that, this, that God spoke to you in this way or that way, we'll see. Because <laughs> it, will, it will either come to pass or it won't. And then we're talking about stoning people and stuff now. <laughs> Malcolm, my daughter said I need to be as funny as you or, or I can't preach, so... So back in 2018, I was sitting in a, serv or in a church. I was just praying by myself and have my own quiet time. And I heard a door slam. Bam. And it kind of shook me. Looked back. Nobody's in here. The door's got those little, like, things that make the door close slowly. So I'm like, hmm, that probably, this might be the Lord doing something. And so I wrote down in my little journal on that day, door slammed, don't know what it means. So me and my wife, we're living life for the next year, and we are still trying to figure out, like, what is this? What is the Lord doing? What was he trying to say? Was this the Lord, or was it the burrito I ate? I don't know. So I didn't, we didn't know what it was, and so we continued to live life. What we would find out, it, it took us until March, until March 15 of 2020, to figure out what God was doing. And what he was doing is he was closing a chapter of our lives and opening a door to a new one. Because March 15th, I started the job at North Trinum Baptist Church here in South Carolina, which was not, on, not in the cards for us. We weren't planning on moving to the East Coast. We were on, we were on the best coast. There's no reason. So... The Lord moved and opened some doors, and now I find myself in South Carolina. But it, wasn't, it was a whole year and some change that we had to figure out why the Lord had closed this door or what this meant when the Lord closed this door. 
I could do you one even more closer. March 6th of 2024, I'm at lunch with a gentleman and he says, um, hey, have you ever heard of Dean Terrace Baptist? Uh, no. So he's like, dude, just go drive, just go drive the neighborhood. Just go see the neighborhood. So I drive on a Wednesday. It was raining. And I just start driving through the community. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> this is Denny Terrace. I'm city through and through. You're talking some rural, overgrown yards, trees, big trees, and all this stuff. And I'm like, man, this is crazy. So I start praying just for the community, not knowing that Sand Hills had any part in anything. Didn't know Pastor Jeff or anything like that. I knew of uh, Pastor Malcolm, nobody else. So I start praying just for the community and what the Lord was gonna do with bringing the pastor there, if the Lord was gonna call me to that church and for me to be the pastor there. I had no clue. So I'm praying through this, just driving around the community. Sit in the parking lot of the church by myself because nobody was there. And I start getting real serious and honest. You guys ever had those prayers with the Lord where you start getting real honest with them? If you haven't, you should try. Uh, so I start, I start having one of those conversations. I'm like, Lord, if this is where you want me to start a church, I don't know if I want to do that here. This is not the place. I'm, you got to drive off Monticello. They have one small sign. If you blink, you'll miss it. And then you turn down Denny. If you miss that sign, you, if you blink, you'll miss it. So you probably are going to miss Denny Terry. Nobody's going to even know where this church is at. I don't, want to, I don't want to do that here. And then I started looking around the community, and I'm like, are people even going to come to church here? I got real honest, and I said, I don't, I don't really, if, if I had a choice, this wouldn't be my number one choice. I'm not saying I won't do it, Lord, but if I, if, this is, if I had a choice, this wouldn't be it. And then this is what I felt the Lord say. This is what I felt the Lord say to me. In me complaining, because that's what I was doing, complaining, he said, why not you? Who do you, who do you think you are? You think, you think that you deserve something bigger and better? Who, who are you? I'm the one that's going to get the glory out of this. Not you. Yeah, the sanctuary isn't as big as the, the Northeast campus. What does that mean? Why don't you go and, and minister to these people because this is the type of neighborhood that you actually come from? I was like, all right, I guess I'm going to Denny Terrace then. <laughs> so, so now I call pastor, uh, my pastor um, back at North Trenum. I said, hey, you know anything about this church? And I think that's when he said that he thought Sand Hills was a part of this or whatever. And so, so we got this whole thing rolling as it's been a great journey so far. We've got some opportunities to, to love on that community over there. Here is what I want you to know. I would submit to you that in 2024, God is still speaking to his people through his people, his word, and his Holy Spirit. Are there other ways? Sure. Can he speak to you in other ways? Absolutely. Some of y'all are real naturey and outdoorsy. I don't even know what that is. And y'all go outside and, and feel something. And like, man, I really feel the Lord doing something. How am I going to argue with that? So God is still speaking in 2024. Write that down if you're taking notes. God is still speaking in 2024. Let's jump to verse 3. It says, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint. Someone say exact imprint. And of, uh, he's the exact imprint of his nature. And he, this is Jesus, upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making, this is a crazy jump in, in the text here. So he talks about the universe and all this. He says, after making purification for sins... He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. 
The writer here is saying that Jesus is the brightness or he exudes the very um, um, dignity or honor of God. Simply put, Jesus is the exact, listen to this, write this down. Jesus is the exact copy of God's essence. Jesus is the exact copy of God's essence. What does that mean? He is the exact copy. He's the replica. He is a, 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 a representation of all that God embodies. He is the visible image of the invisible God. He is the one that now has, has put on flesh and come to earth for one specific purpose. I'm getting chills. To, to go to a cross and to die for our sins so that we would have an opportunity to have a relationship with him. The churchy word that we hear around, around all the time is sanctification. Sanctification simply means becoming more like Christ. And so if, if Jesus is the exact copy of God's essence, he's a great example. He's the greatest example that we could have in how to live our lives. We are in a world where everything is at our fingertips. We are constantly being bombarded with do this, do that, become your best self by this, read this book, take two of these, um, blaze two of these, call me in the morning. That's what the world is telling us to do. All the while, we have an example that's sitting right in front of us that is the greatest, that is actually the exact copy of God's essence. Sanctification equals more like Jesus. Young people, you could write that down. A simple yet difficult thought here is that it should be a li our life goal to become more like Christ. My question now would be, are you or is becoming more like Christ your life goal or is your life goal to become your best self? Because you can become your best self apart from Christ and it will sadly be your worst self. Philippians chapter two, verse nine through 11 says, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at that name, the name of Jesus Every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue will acknowledge or confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus made purification for sin. Some of you in the room may say, I don't know what this guy is talking about. What does purification for sin mean? It's simple. God created us to be with him. But because of Adam and Eve's sin that we inherited, our sins now separated us from God. And sins can't be removed contrary to popular belief just by go doing good things. Not by joining a community group, not by join, not starting your own community group, not by just coming to church on Sunday and actually hitting up a couple different churches or a couple different services. It doesn't like your good deed. The good deeds will never outweigh your sin. Your good deeds will just be good deeds. Your sin is real heavy, and they're not going to be removed just by the doing good stuff. And so God found a master plan that he had planned before the foundations of the world. That's a whole different story. So what he did is he said, I'm going to send my son Jesus to go down and die for, these, for my people. So paying the price for sin, Jesus died. And he didn't stay dead. But three days later, he got up early Sunday morning. That's what I was missing that first service. 
I was, if I was at another church, somebody would have got up and ran around here a couple of times and started I, 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 doing all that stuff. I don't do all that. So some of y'all laughing because y'all been to those churches before. That's what y'all laughing about. No, we need to bring some of that back, man. I'm going to leave that up to you, though. So everyone who puts their faith in Jesus, they have now etern- they have eternal life. And their life begins in Christ that very moment that they, that they accept Christ. We're getting ready to celebrate baptism here today, and these individuals that have, have put their faith in Christ, whether they're older, or younger, the moment that they put their faith in Christ, they, they're, um, they're, for lack of a better term, their ticket to heaven was, was you, were, you were sealed. You were sealed. The older that I get, the more I, I, I am just in awe of how good God really is. There's this thing that starts to happen now that I'm older that like, with my eyes is weird. They, they just start to like, like water comes from me and stuff like all the time. <laughs> but when I remember, someone say remember, remember. your praise, worship, And commitment to God is as good as your memory is. If you can remember where you came from, if you can remember where God has brought you from, if you can remember just the things that you were doing last week, if you can remember going left when you know God told you to go right and he didn't take you out, that's the stuff I think about. Kids in the room. When mom or dad tells you clean your room and you don't. Or you do it not all the way. I'm preaching now. (laughs) I'm preaching now, huh? Or or you are you're told to to clean your chores and your chores aren't cleaned all the way. Listen to me, young people, that is disobedience. On its I'm trying to help somebody. (laughs) On its on its lowest level. I tell you, do this, don't, and you don't do it, or you half do it. That's disobedience, period. Disobedience in the Bible is a what? All y'all know. It's a sin. The wages or the payment for sin is what? Mm. Kids. (laughs) That's why your mama tell you, I took you into this world and I can take you out. No. (laughs) So our sin, our sin, when I think about just how good God is, it's hard for me to hold back. It really is. And I know I'm not the oldest person in the room, but I know that I've experienced life for my age, in my context. For you, it could be completely different. When we get Deeper into this text, I'm, I'm going to show you something else. Let's jump, in, jump back in. One writer says this about these verses. He says, God spake to ancient people at different times and in uh, different times through successive generations and in many different ways as he thought proper, sometimes by personal directions. Uh, sometimes by dreams, sometimes by visions, sometimes by divine influences on the minds of the prophets. Listen to this. The gospel revelation is excellent above the former in that it is the revelation which God has made by, excuse me, his son. So listen to this. In beholding the power or experiencing the power, wisdom, and goodness of Jesus Christ, we behold the power or experience the power, wisdom, and goodness of the Father. If I was to tell you that I can make the best cheesecake in the room, what would y'all say? What'd you say? Let's try it. Let's try it. That was a, that was a jab because think, you think you can do a better cheesecake, huh? No. <laughs> but if I say that, what people are going to say is I want to try that. You are going to say, I want to try that. What I have done in my 37 years of living is I've tried Jesus. 
Somebody told me that Jesus was good and I, ha- and I tried him. There's somebody in the room who hasn't tried him yet. There's somebody in the room that keeps hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and not trying. We can hear how good God is, but if we never try him, I promise you, you're missing out on so much. John 14, 6 and 7 says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If, I had no, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen me. We can never be thankful enough for what God uh, has, for that God has in so many ways and with such clearness spoken to us fallen sinners about salvation. We can't be more thankful. So while the prophets were and still are a necessary good, necessary and good piece of the gospel story, Jesus is greater. It's, it's one thing to hear about how your friends or family or mama or daddy, how they experience Christ, but it's a whole other thing for you to personally experience him for yourself. And let me just tell you, for anybody that think that I grew up in a Christian home, is your ticket into heaven? I might be looking at you from that chasm. Saying, we can't come back and get you, bro. Last thing. Not only is Jesus greater than the prophets, Jesus is better than the angels. In the next nine verses... The writer of Hebrews goes on about how much better Jesus is than the angels by quoting these different scriptures. I think it's also a worthy point to note here that many Jews had a superstitious and um, idolatrous um, respect for angels. So they did some weird stuff and had these these, um, weird notions about who, who these angels were. And so what they ended up doing is they thought that they were a a mediator between God and, and the people. And so they would have like religious ceremonies and, and weird stuff and worship for them. So this is why now I, I believe the writer of Hebrews goes on to tell us all these things about how good, how much greater Jesus is than these angels. He says, verse five, he says, for to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son today, I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. That's from a messianic, messianic Psalm um, 2, verse 7. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. He, we, can read, we read about angels worshiping Jesus at his birth, right? Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. That's from Psalm 104, 4. But of the sons, he says, your, uh, but of the son, excuse me, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom, and you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. That's from another messianic psalm. A messianic psalm is a psalm that points us to Jesus. That's 45, 6, and 7. Verse 10, he says, and the Lord laid the foundation of the earth in in the beginning and the heavens are are the work of your hand. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up like a garment. They will change, but you are the same and your years have no end. I don't got enough time to talk about how much, how good God is and and, and experience him and, and the consistency of him in my life. I've changed. I've done stuff I know I shouldn't have done. I've said stuff I know I shouldn't have done. He hasn't. He's done right forever. And so I want to be a part of that. I want to, I want to serve that. I want to, I want to experience that. So when the, the wiles of the devil come, I'm able to stand. Verse 
13 says, and to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? That's another messianic psalm. Rounding out in verse 14, he says, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve? For the sake of those who are to inherit salvation, he's talking to us, talking about us. Angels are sent to serve us. This is what one writer says about this as we wrap up. The most exalted angels are but ministering spirits, mere servants of Christ to execute his commands. The saints are us. At present, our heirs not yet come into possession. So we have, we're waiting on heaven. We're waiting to get to heaven. It says, the angels minister to us in opposing the malice and power of the evil spirits, in protecting and keeping our bodies, instructing and comforting our souls under Christ and the Holy Ghost. Here goes two lessons learned as we close. Write this down. It's good to hear stories of God, of what God has done. It's good to hear stories of what God has done, but it's great to experience God for yourself. Hebrews 10.25 tells us to not forsake the assembling of the, of the saints like some people are doing nowadays. So it's good to hear the stories, but it's great to experience them. Last one is it's good to have to give, it's good to give God weekend visits, but it's great when Jesus has full custody. Jesus made purification for our sins and for your sins and mine while we were still sinners. He didn't wait for us to get it right before he went to the cross. He knew. He knew that we were going to screw up, and he still died for you, still died for me, knowing that we were going to screw up. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to bring up Pastor Malcolm, um, and we get to celebrate with, uh, in baptism. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for what we have experienced today. Father, I pray that we would truly experience you, that we wouldn't only hang out and and hang on to the stories that we hear from friends and family members, but we would actually taste and see that you really are good. So good that we want to go out and tell everyone about you, not in a weird way, but in a just authentic, genuine, like, man, I love the Lord. And he has truly been there for me through situations or just my life as a child. Father, we thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. Amen. Amen.